Yeah, I, I left uh, Arup in February to, to join the University of Liverpool to create the Centre for Digital Built Environment. And with the mandate and mission of to support the digital transformation of the built environment through research and education, and not just the education of the next generation, which universities tend to look at, but also the education of the whole industry and what we need to develop skills and competencies to enable all of us to take this digital transformation journey. And I've been... One of the other things I, I sort of came to thinking is we need, you know, we need a few more honest brokers about BIM in the industry. Uh, we need uh, a few pathfinders, honest brokers, people who, who are, uh, aren't scared to say, well, it's not working at the moment, but this is how we can work together. Uh, we might need a few sheriffs uh, in town. Uh, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, BIM Wild West out there. Uh, we, we definitely don't need any BIM trolls at all. You know, we, we've got to get together and we've got to work together. Uh, and we don't want, need any disapproving mother-in-laws either, sort of looking over our shoulder and, you know, saying, no, no, not good enough. So if my title question was about LOX. Uh, and uh, LOX, if, if this is the answer, what is the question? And, and the question could be one of two things. Uh, first of all, how do we define scope and deliverables for BIM? It's absolutely fundamental to that, but also critically important is how do we check we've received what we actually asked for. Uh, so, first of all, LOX, you know, what, it's a bit different, isn't it? Maybe you've not come across that term before. So, LOX is basically level of stuff, uh, because there's so many acronyms out there. So. Uh, I'm going to put a few of them up there, and uh, uh, you know, I'd like to ask you. So, LOD. What does LOD mean? Level of. So, who says level of definition, and who says, put your hand up. Level of detail. Put your hand up. Okay. So you both right. It's great. <laughs> Everyone's a winner. LOI. Level of information. Yeah. LOA. Accuracy. Uh, level of accuracy. Yeah. Uh, LOC. Level of control. level of control, yeah, I've not, not heard that one before, but level of <laughs> level of content, content. yeah, <laughs> level of level of concrete, <laughs> great. <laughs> Spot the structural engineer in the room. <laughs> so level of uh, clash, level of coordination, level of completeness, level of connectivity, all of them are used out there in the industry. Uh, LOT. <laughs> yeah. Level of tolerance uh, and LOL. Laugh out loud. No. Le level of location, actually. Uh, it exists out there. Uh, so, going back to the beginning, uh, Puzzle 1192 Part 2, uh, it gave us a lot of things. It, it gave us the new project stages, you know, the uh, one to one to seven, uh, instead of the letters of the alphabet that, I, well, certainly as a building structural engineer, I was used to beforehand. Uh, gave us BIM, actually the definition of what is BIM, and going back to a point uh, Anne raised, it's about designing, constructing, or operating a building or infrastructure asset, so it's not just about design and construction. It actually goes some way to define in level two, uh, and Interestingly, Kobe is actually in Puzzle 1192 Part 2. One of the key Level 2 requirements is the exchange of standard of Kobe and PDF as well as copies of the native file. So it's, it's there, actually, in black and white. When people say, we don't need to do Kobe, or well, we can still do Level 2, you know, there's a question mark ar around that. Uh, and it also gave us this idea of model uses, you know, this idea of what potentially you could use models for at different stages of the of the uh, of the project, but the critical thing I think is is this diagram, which I Anne showed this morning, uh, the information flow through the project, and particularly the thing that initially I'm interested in to talk about with the LOX question is uh, is is this level down here, which is the information transactions, which is the thing that the client needs to make decisions to uh, to take the project forward. So LOX is, is fundamental to defining the information transactions that are taking place between the client and the design team. And this goes back to the same question. 
the client therefore needs to be specific about the, the deliverables. And we are brilliant in, in the English language about being ambiguous with what we actually mean. So it's obvious, <laughs> isn't it? It means Brexit means Brexit. Level two means level two. It's obvious, isn't it? Why, why, why all this problem? You know, but ambiguous is what we do. You know, this was from uh, The Hobbit. Uh, what do you mean when you Gandalf's wish good morning? What do you mean? Do you wish me a good morning or mean that it's good morning whether or not I want it or not? That feel good this morning or that it's a morning to be good on? And this is the root of the problem, I think, in our industry is ambiguous, ambiguity with what we actually ask for, what the client asks for, what we deliver, what we deliver between teams. And I've seen this, uh, you know, people say, oh, you know, well, we used to have stage C. Stage C report, it was different depending on which consultant delivered it. I'd, I'd review uh, stage C reports for, for clients. Can you say whether or not this is a stage C report? Oh, it's not quite the way I do it, but yeah, they've got most of the stuff in there and I quite like the way they've done this. I might copy that next time I do one of those. Or, you know, the, the ambiguity. So. The problem is when we get to a digital deliverable and when people, when we're exchanging information and we're exchanging data and people are using that data directly to build on, we cannot be ambiguous anymore. We need to be absolutely crystal clear on what we ask for. And there's a lot of industry reports about uh, loss, the client losing a lot of money through uh, inadequate interoperability. So this was a report published in 2006, I think, uh, by the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US. And this was the US capital facilities uh, industry, uh, so the GSA uh, in, in the US. And they 15.8 billion was wasted from about 330 billion budget every single year because what they termed in inadequate interoperability. People basically having to duplicate tasks uh, again with, within their own remit. So we're all structural engineers in, in the room. Well, I'm assuming most of us are showing. We do have an architect uh, <laughs> at the front. Uh, but how many times have we seen architects redraw columns that we've provided? You know, they've spent time and money drawing columns again. Our columns, and often they don't actually quite line up with what we wanted. Certainly not the, the right size anyway. <coughs> Uh, so, you know, we've got a whole series of uh, duplication of tasks and this is one thing we, we really need to get to the bottom of it. So, the first and most important question we need to ask is, you know, what information does the client need to allow the project to progress? Any more information than that, we're either wasting the client's money or we're wasting our own money. Uh, so we need to be absolutely crystal clear about this. And this is one of the fundamental deliverables of uh, level two is the employer's information requirements. It's the brief, it's the brief that we have to hit. And we need to extract that from the client and work with the client to try and uh, be clear about that so we can hit their objectives and not waste time delivering stuff that we don't need to deliver. Uh, and this has roots uh, in PAS 1192 part three uh, and there's a couple of acronyms, OIR, yeah, Organisational Information Requirements, AIR, which we've seen before today, and EIR, Employees Information Requirements. Uh, and this is how those are generated. The organisational requirements are, are what the client needs for business continuity to actually operate their business effectively, which generates information that they need to get out of the asset, which in turn generates information that we need to provide to the client by the end of the project to feed back into the, uh, the asset information model uh, and, and to, to complete this circle. So all of these things actually work together. So out of interest, how many people are working on a project with an employee's information requirement document? Yeah, so pro what, about 10 maybe out, out of the audience. How many of those are actually derived from an asset information uh, requirement document? One. And, and was that in turn defined from the organisational information requirements? It, it was, yeah. So, hooray, you one, one person. That's, that's, that's amazing, though. But this is 
this is part of the problem. It's, and I think pro perhaps one of the blockers is getting the clients to actually appreciate, uh, getting the client to appreciate that this can actually be valuable to them and their business and their business continuity. So the EIR is the exam question. Uh, and the BIM execution plan is the uh, answer to the exam question. But it's not just about 3D, the EIR. It's about information. Uh, and it's about the behaviours and the culture of what we're trying to change in the industry. So I, I recently reviewed a project, a European project called BIM for VET, which is vocational educational training. And they have defined four new roles. Uh, the BIM author, the senior BIM author, the BIM coordinator, and the BIM manager. And my response back to them is, where's the BIM director? <laughs> you know? Where's the guy who's actually, you know, signing the contract, who's agreeing the scope and deliverables, whose business is on the line of his BIM author, senior BIM author, BIM coordinator, and BIM manager aren't actually delivering? Uh, and this is something we also need to tackle. BIM isn't just about 3D. It's not about the. It's not just about uh, the, uh, the the 3D. It's about behaviours and cultures, and it's about everybody. It's about skills that we all need to develop throughout the whole industry to be able to deliver this. So one of the projects that UK BIM Alliance has actually put forward is this idea of, around trying to uh, articulate the sort of information that clients may need at the operational handover phase. Uh, they've re reviewed uh, BS 1192 Part 4, which is the COBE development. They've looked at the, uh, the purpose driven. What is the purpose that a client is going to ask for information at the end of the project? And They've reviewed uh, the COBE information, the structure of that, and they've actually produced a, a spreadsheet where they've added more information than is currently provided for uh, in COBE. And this is going to be launched at Digital Construction Week. It's open source. Everybody is going to be able to look at that, look at the sort of information. And hopefully this will complete a cycle where we're actually able to start adding more information into COBE. Uh, hopefully the next phase of this will be they'll start looking at the handover phase for infrastructure assets. So currently the current is looking at building assets. And hopefully my, my thing is to start thinking about moving down the chain into uh, the design phases. What are the information that clients need at different gateways throughout the design process to enable them to move forward? So this is another document that's been mentioned to uh, today already, a CIC BIM protocol. So how many people in the audience are who are doing a BIM project have actually got something like uh, a contractual deliverable or, or a BIM protocol in place? So first of all, who's, who's got BIM as a contractual deliverable? Right, okay, five, five, uh, five or six. And how many of those have actually got some sort of a BIM protocol in place? Three. Uh, so again, this is the sort of thing we're, we're seeing, that, that people are, things like uh, level two BIM, BIM is being asked for as a deliverable. There was far more people who were, were working on, on BIM projects than actually have it as a contractual deliverable, and far less of that who are actually protected by what's in the, in the contract in terms of what's in the BIM protocol. So in terms of the BIM protocol, CIC BIM protocol, I know this is being updated at the moment, but Appendix A, there's two appendices in, in this document, both really important. Appendix B is actually a pro forma employees information requirements document. Uh, and Appendix A is a model uh, production delivery table, they call it in uh, the CIC BIM protocol. Both are really important. Now, you could do the CIC BIM protocol with different documents to represent each of those appendices. But what's really important is that the uh, the, the appendices actually exist. So this was the first draft. I mean, this was produced, I think, back in 2012. So it was one of the first documents that actually uh, came out. And what's interesting about this is this assigns LOD, uh, which you talk about level of detail, and they assign it by stage as a blanket stage across the whole model. 
Now, the industry has moved back from doing that because people don't believe that it's right to have a level of detail applied at the whole model for the whole stage, simply because that's not the way we actually work. I mean, some of us, if we're doing a, a precast, uh, if we're doing a post tension slab, that's going to be a contractor design element. So we're not going to have that at the same level of uh, development as uh, the rest of the superstructure. So m level of uh, LOD, LOI should really apply at the element level rather than at the whole model. But yet we're seeing that sort of level of confusion. Maybe that's a different LOC actually to add to the list. <coughs> the BET, uh, the BIM execution plan, is a response. It's the answer back to the EIR. And as this cascades down through the chain, uh, I, I've heard of people binding BIM execution plans into contracts to issue to other people. Like a contractor might uh, take a BIM execution plan and make that a contractual deliverable further down the chain. I actually think that it should be an, an EIR written as an EIR down the chain. And then each person further down the chain writes back their e exam uh, question, uh, you know, their exam answer back to that stuff. OK, Mr. Contractor, I'm a subcontractor. I'm going to supply this stuff. You've asked me to deliver this as my information deliverable. This is how I'm going to go about doing that. Does that satisfy your requirements? But the BEP has uh, a list of good, uh, these are in my opinion anyway, some of the things that a BEP should have as a response back. Uh, it should talk about the project goals, what the responding team are trying to do and, and meeting the client's goals. The BIM uses, how they're going to pr uh, use the information, how they're intending to use the information within the team. The information exchange protocols, collaboration procedures and the activities, the quality control, IT, uh, hardware, software, uh, quality controls in there twice because it's so important. <coughs> Uh, and the project delivery, uh, which is the model information delivery table. So this is an example of a model information delivery table. How many people have been in receipt of model information delivery tables? So when you get the model information delivery table for the first time, did you notice, like on this one, where they've just gone, uh, like 300 for, like, all the way down. Everything at this stage is 300. Everything at this stage is 200. It's like, do, do, have, you, have you seen that? And then you have to go back and sort of say, no, 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 I'm, I'm only going to take this element up to 200, this element I'm going to agree with you, I'll go up to 300. So there's that negotiation phase. But it seems to me that every time I've received one, it's just been blanket. Somebody's just gone through and filled in 200, 300, 400 for each stage. Uh, and, and it's up to us then to respond on that as part of negotiation. LOX is a, is a difficult beast. It is evolved. It's a worldwide phenomena. Uh, this is a, a blog uh, that uh, Marzia uh, has, has done as, as part of a PhD, uh, tracking how all the different LOD ideas have evolved uh, within that and how they all relate within uh, this framework. So the LOX, again, that, that I've come across, uh, level of development or level of detail, LOD. Level of geometry, I've come across that, LOG. Uh, level of information, obviously, level of accuracy. Level of coordination, clash. Level of completeness or level of connectivity. Level of tolerance, level of location, level of suitability, and level of finality. Uh, uh, and I have seen all of those at some point listed. <coughs> Uh, and it's a pretty confusing state, to be honest with you. All, w all raised with good reason and good intent to try and, uh, you know, try and uh, have a level of reliability, uh, to try and find, you know, to try and uh, bottom out some requirement. Uh, at the moment, Sen have con convened a panel to try and grapple with this LOX question. Uh, it's a sub-panel of 442. Uh, and Building Smart, which I, I sit on as well, has pulled together a working group to try and respond back with our uh, thoughts on the LOX question. So on the Building Smart uh, panel, we've got members from UK, US, Canada, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, Italy and China, all contributing our thoughts on the LOX question. 
uh, and we will correspond that back with sen. So I'm going to go through a little bit of the different, uh, you know, those different LOXs uh, and talk a little bit about each one of them. So the first one is LOD. Uh, this grew out of the uh, American Institute of Architects uh, and is now held by BIM Forum, a US group. Has everybody, anybody seen that document? You know, you, what you'll see is whenever you see an LOD in the hundreds, on a, on a model information delivery table, this is the document that it's referring to. Uh, LOD is in single digits. LOD 12345 is the UK version. LOD 100, 200, 300, 400 is the American version, uh, which is this document. It's by element, not model. So again, you could have different LODs for different levels, uh, different elements within the model. Uh, columns could be different to beams, could be different to slabs. Uh, historically, it's been all about geometry. Uh, so this is a concrete beam at 200 or 300, uh, 350, 400 with the reinforcement starting to come in. But now they've started to include attributes as well. So they've sort of saying, you know, there's a minimum amount of attributed data that's going to go in at these different stages as well as the geometry. So the start of combining where the UK version, which I'll come on to in a minute, separates out detail and information. The American is starting to combine it with a minimum number of parameters. The UK version combined this. This was the uh, digital toolkit that was created by MBS. Again, element, not model. Or actually, it, it doesn't really do element. It sort of looks at system or product. Uh, it can have different LODs and LOIs by different stages, so it can be very complex to, to fill in because you can have for a single element at a particular stage, you can have to fill in both the LOD that you require and the LOI that you require. The LODs look very similar graphically to uh, traditional deliverables for the different stages, concept uh, and, and design, detail design. Uh, and this is where I really start to struggle with the, uh, the, BIM to, uh, the BIM toolkit. The LOI is actually, it, it's all about linking back to products. Uh, it's got none of the information that me as a structural engineer would feel that I would need to have in the model, or in fact that people ask for me as a structural engineer. Uh, and this leads to an interesting question about the, the, the ability to have this, this uh, complex arrangement of s detailed specification of the elements is this question of should this be packaged or unpackaged? And by packaged, should there be industry standard of recognised deliverables at stage two? We do LOD 200, LOI 200, uh, LOI to LOD2 in the UK, it means this and it's actually prescribed, or should it actually be more pull from somebody who's actually saying, I need to run quantities at this level of certainty, therefore, Mr. Structural Engineer, I need you to design at this level to be able to do that. Should it be push or should it be pull? You know, should it be packaged or unpackaged? You know, it has to be in my opinion, and again, this is sort of o open for debate, but I think it should be based on what somebody is asking me to do with that information. Maybe a minimum level of packaged information, like packaged uh, attributes, but then somebody needs to say, well, actually, I, I need this additional information. You know, can you provide me this information? And the, the, the issue around that is... So I, I, I was catching a train to London the other day, bumped into a friend of mine, architect, and he said, uh, I have a problem with the structural engineer. You know, these guys are supposed to be great at BIM. Uh, I'm putting in my planning drawings, and, and they've provided me a structural model, but I, I can't send that onto my visualizers. It's like the columns aren't in the right place, and they're not the right size and everything. And I'm like, really, you expect a structural engineer to be doing that sort of level of coordination for planning at that early stage? Have you actually paid him to do that extra level of work? So 
this question is sort of what is it that people actually want to do with the information and are they willing to uh, you know, enter into dialogue about, well, actually it means me doing a lot more work at this stage. If that's what you want to do with that information, if that's what you want to do with that geometry, this is how, many, this is how much longer it's going to take me to do it, to do it at that level. And the other thing that I've heard of, uh, not seen directly, but I've heard of is QS is starting to demand uh, much more detail at much earlier stages so they can actually push a button and, and bring out the, the quantities. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'd like you to, to work at LOD 300 at, at concept stage. Uh, it's like, really? Does the client know that you actually want us to work at that? And what about the rest of the design team for us to be able to do that? So, you know, the... <sighs> BIM, I think, it should be about pull. It should be an honest dialogue about what people need from you and, and enter into a contract to deliver that information to the design team. And this is going to become more important as we really get to grips with what lean construction means because lean construction is all about pull. You know, not doing any superfluous tasks unless it provides information that somebody is able to use downstream. So my personal view of the LOD LOI uh, by MBS is it doesn't really work very much for elements. It does need improving. A level of prepackaging would be beneficial uh, because it really is time consuming to fill this out on a, on a project. Uh, and it does not contain the attributes that structural engineers or actually most of the other design team members actually need to be interacting. So the question for us is how do we, right, okay. How do, we actually, uh, how, how do we actually engage as a structural engineering community into that? I'm going to rush over this. Uh, this was the results back from the, uh, uh, the LOD uh, survey, which you can, you can read. Uh, and the information requirements between collaborators is really important. Uh, it's not just the, the information that I need to do my task, but I deliver what I take as my inputs to my task is the outputs from somebody else's task. What I deliver as the outputs from my task is the inputs to somebody else. And although the LO, you know, the, the dialogue, the EIR, enter, starts a dialogue between the employer and the design team, there actually is a much more complicated question, which is the information that as a design team we actually need to share between ourselves. Uh, this is uh, BIMQ. Uh, again, I think everybody gets the slides, don't they? So, will we get the slides? Yeah. So, y this is uh, this is a, a technology solution uh, that I put into to that problem, but I'm just going to uh, whiz, whiz over that really uh, to talk about some of the other issues. Uh, okay. So, level of accuracy. Uh, that was created in the US. Uh, it's based on surveys for existing buildings. Level of clash or level of coordination. I first came across this from my Australian colleagues and they were trying to use this to get over this illusion or being pushed to deliver clash-free models at early design stages by putting in an, an acceptable tolerance of a clash at a concept stage and say, well, of course you've got a clash. It's a concept model. Uh, what's the problem with that? Uh, so. Level of location and level of completeness of finality. This was a question about trying to decide whether or not it was ready to be constructed. And we came to the conclusion that actually there's, there's not a need for uh, different levels. It's a binary choice. Is it ready to be constructed or not? You don't need different levels of completeness and f or finality or frozenness. Level of suitability. These are the codes that the UK have placed into 1192-2007, and these are to try and limit what people can do with the model. Uh, you know, what can you rely on the model and what can you use it for? I have been in the situation where I walked into a design uh, meeting with a, a client and, and the QS, and the QS said, great, I, uh, you know, really good news, uh, we've reduced the tonnage of steel work on the job by 30%. Uh, and as structural engineers, we were like, uh, how did you do that? And it's like, oh, we, we just ran the quantities off the model you gave us. And we said, well, that was for information. That was not for costing. Oh, it's in the cost plan now. <laughs> it's like, you know, the, the, all the, 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 the uh, 
the densities weren't correct in the in the steelwork model, so it wasn't pulling across the densities right, and 30% of the elements. Uh, so, you know, what are you going to use it for? Are you going to use it for information? Can somebody rely on it for costing? Can somebody rely on it for construction? So, this is uh, while I was going to ask some questions. Have I got time to do that? <laughs> Uh, I can be really quick. It's just a hand, a hand show, actually. So, uh, right. So, can I have a show of hands based on what we've seen? Do you think the LOX quantity should be uh, with the model or elements? Put your hand up if you think it should be elements. Okay. Uh, and if you think it's a model? So, yeah. Uh, so, that's, that's in line with what we, we thought. LOX concepts should be used to define a specific project agreement uh, which helps define the model collaboration process. This is a question about should it be pre-packaged or should it be project specific? Put your hand up if you think it should be pre-packaged. To a certain extent, but the ability to then sort of modify it. So a pre-packaged to give you a starting point, but ultimately, so put your hand up if you think ultimately it should be project specific requirement. I think that's everybody, great. Uh, LOX should not predetermine the BIM use cases, uh, and this is sort of the question about pull rather than push. Do you think anybody, sh should people be telling you how they're going to use the model and then ask for the information, or should anybody be able to run any uh, BIM use based on, on the information we give you? Put your hand up if you think the sh people should be asking or telling you what they're going to use the model for. Okay, that's the majority of people, great. Okay, thank you Thanks very much. much.